And here we are with Pivot here to bring us words of encouragement. Um, and Pastor Richard and Pastor Brandy are going to co-preach this morning. But in case Amen. you don't know who Pastor Richard is, he's the director of Pivot Ministries, one of our mission partners um, that takes men in and reminds them who they are. Amen. And watches, in the name of Jesus. And watches Christ create them new. So let's pray as we dive into John 13 and hear stories from Pastor Richard today. Not stories. Truths. truths. Yes, Amen. truths. Thank you, Lord, for the way you love us. Thank you for the powerful world, word that we are about to unpack and play with together. Yes, Lord. That we would receive it, that we would know who we are even more because we did so, and that you would make us ready to give. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, here we go. So today... We are exploring a very familiar part of the Gospel of John. We are in Jerusalem and we read in John 13 and we read in John 12 last week, his hour had come. This is a big deal because throughout the Gospel of John, we keep reading over and over again how Jesus slipped through the clutches of the people, the authorities who wanted him because, quote, his hour had not yet come. But in John 13, 1, we read, Jesus knew the time had come. The time Amen. had come. Amen. From this point on, we're going to be walking with Christ to his crucifixion and his resurrection. And from this point on, Jesus is no longer in public. He's only speaking to his disciples and his close followers. He's addressing only the people who believe in him. And John writes this as a really good narrator. Remember John 1? In the beginning was the word. It's kind of like that here. Okay, dear readers, I'm going to put you in the place where you need to be so you can read the rest of this gospel. And John 13, 1, the writer is telescoping out and, and giving us the context. He writes this. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. John is very interested in the motivation of Jesus. What's Jesus' motivation? Love. Indeed, for the next few chapters, we will see how Jesus expresses his love for his followers. He does it three ways. He does it in deed, love in deed, love in word, and love in prayer. And today... We're going to explore Jesus' love through deed. What did Jesus choose to do for the disciples to show his love and why? Let's so let's read the text. If you have your Bibles open, you can follow along. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. 
What a beautiful passage. Mm -hmm. So much detail. I love the way John describes Jesus in this text. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. He knew he had come from God and was returning to God. All this love, all this power. So what did he do? What did Jesus do with all this love and all this power? He got up from the meal. He left his position at the table. He took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. That's a little undignified. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now that's really undignified. What's happening here? What's happening here? Power and love are infused into Jesus to Christ. He can do anything he wants, but he chooses to do this. Hmm. And in the context of this culture, that was a really big deal because in, in first century Palestine, foot washing, when you enter a house at the end of the day, was standard practice because people wore sandals and they walked around on really dirty, dusty stone roads, and there were a lot of animals that walked on those roads too, leaving specific deposits. So when you walked into a house, it was important to clean your feet, really for the protection of the people in the house as much as for everyone else. So when a guest arrived, in the case of an ordinary home, the host would provide a basin of water right at the door, and a guest would wash their own feet. But in a more wealthy house, a slave would do that or a servant would mm -hmm. do the washing. And this job was considered so menial and undignified that a Jewish servant was exempt from doing that job. So that was reserved just for the dirty Gentiles to do. So there are serious social implications here. In no way ever any place would you find someone with a higher status washing the feet of someone who was beneath them. So think about Jesus' actions in this gospel passage. During the Passover meal, he removes his outer garment and he's left with a loose-fitting inner robe, kind of like an oversized t-shirt, if you will. He's basically stripping down to his first century skivvies and taking on the role of a really lowly servant. Jesus is using his power and his love to do something humble. He's washing the feet of his disciples. He washed the feet of the disciple who would betray him. He washed the feet of the disciple who would doubt him. He washed the feet of the disciple who would deny him. Mm -hmm. He did not care. He just loved. And he used that power to serve undignified. And him doing that took no power away. It took no power from him. And when Peter protests, it's emphatic. You aren't going to wash my feet. The placement of the pronouns tells us that for him, this was all about status. You have a higher status than me, Jesus. No way am I letting you serve me. I believe that this passage challenges us to receive. Mm -hmm. It challenges us to let go of any illusion mm -hmm. that we ourselves in our own power can serve God without first receiving love from God, mm -hmm. sometimes in ways that are really hard to receive. And then Jesus turns it over to us. So let's pick it up in verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. 
Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is, a mas nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every day, every day in our homes, Every day in our communities, we are invited to receive love that we do not deserve. Mm. And every day, every day in our homes and in our communities, we are invited to use our love and our power to serve people in ways that we might think are beneath us. And in this very text today, even though it's long ago and far away, it inspires us. It invites us to do just that, to receive, to receive the love of Jesus, and then to love, to love by serving others, just as Jesus did, even in spaces that may be challenging. I'm reminded of a story in my own journey when I first came to Pivot back in 2007. I recall Pivot visiting Stanwich Church in Greenwich. It's a church much similar to New Orleans Presbyterian. The Pivot Choir was scheduled to sing there on Pivot Sunday. We visited the church that Thursday night before Pivot Sunday to practice with the Stanwich Choir. I remember clearly that night, it was a severe ice storm. As, as a matter of fact, at that time, it was one of the most severe storms Connecticut ever had. Well, you got to picture this. Forty pivot men coming into the church were all dripping and soaking wet with heavy winter coats on, and we all sit in the front pews of the church. Shortly after we arrived, this very unassuming lady enters into the sanctuary, and she simply says, Welcome to Stanwich Church. May I take your coats? She put out her arms just like this, and all of us just got up and just layered our coats over her arms. It took her about three trips to gather all the coats. On the final trip, she disappeared behind a set of double doors, and we didn't see her anymore for the evening. Well, that following Sunday was Pivot Sunday at Stanwich. I was sitting on the third row on the owl seat. The music began to play, and shortly as after it began to play, a procession of people passed my pew. And who was leading the procession? <laughs> the lady who took my coat that stormy Thursday night. There she was, robed in all her clergy splendor, <laughs> all of her clergy vestments. I turned to the guy next to me. Oh, my God. That's the lady who took my coat. She's a pastor. She's a pastor. This totally blew me away. <laughs> Pastors don't take people's coats. They should. Especially those of a group of drug addicts. Mm -hmm. Totally blown away. I watched her as she walked onto the pulpit. She turned to face us, and she quietly sat down, having the face as an angel. I sat in that pew, just staring at her in awe the entire service. How was she able to humbly serve and take the coats of 40 men struggling with addiction, many of whom had been counted out? Well, saints, when we are a part of Jesus and he is a part of us, we are able to truly love and serve others just as he did. Receiving the love of Jesus enables us to love others as he did. Hmm. We're called to serve. We're called to serve one another. We're called to love one another. But saints, that love isn't something that we achieve. Amen. It's something we receive. Mm -hmm. We receive the love of Jesus, and then we share it with others. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, the text says we're blessed. Mm -hmm. 
But at the same time, we impact a number of lives in a tremendous way. I was moved by the love of that pastor who took my coat. My life changed forever. It began my journey. It began my transformation. It was an awakening. My heart opened to the love of Jesus, a love for which I felt I wasn't worthy of. And then it empowered me to go on to love and to serve others with the same heart and the same love. It reminds me of Pivot's motto, enter to change, remain to grow, and depart to serve. The men who enter Pivot, including myself, we enter with some pretty dirty feet. Mm. We all need a good washing. We enter to change and we remain and we grow in the word of God. We grow in the tremendous love that he has for us. And then this enables us to make a choice, to walk in dignity and to serve others, no longer for selfish gain or vain conceit. Now, by no means am I boasting and by no means do I want you to think I have arrived. As blessed as I was that day I met that pastor, even today, I still strive to live a good life, to live a life of service. And you know what? Sometimes it can still be a struggle. Mm -hmm. I believe if we're all honest, there are spaces in all of our lives where we may struggle mm -hmm. in loving and serving. Perhaps you can name a few in your own lives. Status image, wealth, people differences, ego. Yeah. One of those spaces for me is fear. Yeah. Fear can hinder me from receiving and serving. As a matter of fact, I was faced with this very challenge just a couple of months ago. <laughs> Several of the Pivot students and I, every morning at 530 we go jogging at a nearby middle school. We're out there at 5.30 on the track. One recent morning, I, I noticed a guy laying over on the bench as I was running. Now, I remind you, it's 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> After my first lap, I get this nudge in my spirit to go and pray for the guy on the bench. I totally ignored it. I just kept jogging. After the second nudge came along, I'm still pushing back on it. I knew it was the Lord asking me to go and pray for this guy, but my response was, Lord, it's 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> We're in Bridgeport. I don't know that guy over there. This may not be very safe for me. This could end pretty badly. But nonetheless, the Lord kept nudging at my spirit. Finally, I decided to go over and pray for this guy. Safety is still an issue, mind you. I take a couple of the students over along with me. I introduce myself to the gentleman. He tells me his name is Dwight. Dwight and I, we spoke for a while. I tell him all about Pivot. And then I ask him, Dwight, can I pray for you? And he kindly accepted my prayer. After praying, he said he would think about coming to Pivot. Well, the next morning, the students and I were out there again running as usual, and there Dwight is again on the bench. Dwight and I spoke a little more that morning, and today, even right now, Dwight is a part of the Pivot program. As a matter of fact, Dwight has joined us this morning. Dwight, why don't you stand up for us? Saints, it was inviting Jesus in. It was receiving Jesus. We both get to experience the gifts of receiving and giving. Fully receiving what Jesus has given me helps me to point others to Jesus so that they may come to know him as well. <laughs> ben, you're the best. Dwight, I think it takes a lot of courage to even to be here. Thank you for being here. I also wonder how it felt in that park for you, if you felt invisible. 
people walking by all the time. I wonder how much courage it took for you to receive from Richard. You didn't know who he was. It was 5.30 <laughs> in the morning in Bridgeport, right? Yeah. A bunch of guys walking toward you. So you received attention from a random jogger in the park. Thank you. Thank mm. you for showing us what it looks like to receive. Amen. So many of us are terrified of that. Mm. Thank you. I've never felt invisible on a park bench in Bridgeport. Probably most of us here haven't. But I have felt invisible in other places. I wonder if you can consider some of the places in your life where you may have felt invisible. I was 20 years old. I was studying abroad, and I was a gopher for uh, an American broadcast news network. And my job was the graveyard shift, which meant everyone went to sleep, and I stayed up to see if any breaking news happened. And back then, we had to read the wires, so it was like coming off of like this fax machine. So I just sat in front of a fax machine all night, wondering if I had to wake up the producers. Mm -hmm. One night, we were having our handoff meeting. The producers were about to go to bed, and the graveyard was about to come on, and um, we're sitting around the table getting the handoff. And the big deal producer looked at me around that table, had a big old bar of Toblerone. Do you all know what Toblerone is? The best chocolate ever. She said, Brandy, I want you to have this because I know it's hard to stay up all night. I had no idea that she even knew my name. I think when I was 20 mm. years old, I had no sense that I was an actual person, like mutual with others, viable in the world. I thought I was just there to serve and no one needed to notice me. Mm. I know it's not the same story as you, right? But for me to feel seen and to feel like I actually had something to offer, it was a big deal. Mm. And I think that really helped me um, to step in and to become a person who received a viable person who had something then to contribute, not just someone to hide mm. around a conference table and sneak away and work from midnight to eight in the morning. I think this passage asks us a question. Is our identity in what we give or is our identity in what we have received? Mm. Not in what we have attained, not in what we have earned, not in what we have consumed. We don't consume God's love, we receive it. Not in what we have even experienced. We cannot give what we have not received. Then I was thinking, what's the opposite of receiving? The opposite of receiving isn't really giving, in this context, I think the opposite of receiving is striving. Mm. The opposite of receiving is worrying <laughs> or hoarding. Or as you said, Richard, mm. fear. fear. Yeah, yeah. So Jesus invites us all to receive what he has freely and graciously poured out. I can't help but think about that scene again in the beginning of the chapter when Jesus is sitting around a table with all of his beloved disciples. Let's just take a moment in your mind's eye. Just imagine yourselves there in that space with Jesus. You're in that space where he humbles himself to be a lowly servant to serve us. That scene is a foreshadow of what was yet to come, to see that very next day, he did that very thing for all of us. Once again, he removed his outer garment, his robe of glory, and he takes on the role of a servant. He humbly dies on a cross. His shed blood has cleansed us of our sins, that we may have new life and have it abundantly. Saints, we've been washed once and for all by the blood of Jesus. That's his work on the cross. That's what we are invited to receive. And subsequently, we are washed daily through the application of his word. It's through receiving the great gift from Jesus 
that we remained in fellowship with him. And we are empowered to serve one another, just as the pastor who takes the coat of a stranger or the person who takes the time to pray for someone in a park or the person who takes the time to receive a prayer and says yes to Jesus. We're all invited to follow Christ's example. Amen. Friends, you are not invisible to Christ. You are not invisible. Mm. The co-creator of the universe who has every power available at all ever in the creation from, from the beginning of the world sees you, loves you, and uses that power not to be over you, but to serve you. How beautiful is that? Mm. Amen. May God have mercy on us as we attempt to receive. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you just love us. Thank you that you love us. Show us how to receive that love. Show us how to receive that love so that we might also give that love so that others too may receive. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.